Bentley from University College London Institute of Education. Um, the title of my talk is Forces of English, Facing the Demands of Researching, Publishing, and Teaching in English in Non-Anglophone Higher Education. Uh, so I just want to get started with something that will be familiar, but um, also quite striking, and that is um, the development of the world's major languages. And I'm referring to the work of David Gradle from seven years ago now. Um, but in, so I've just marked 2021 here um, on this chart, but you can see here that the growth of, for example, Arabic is projected to kind of continue the way that it has been. The growth of French um, is expected to slightly taper off as population changes um, in, in Francophone, in the Francophone world change. Um, Spanish, similar trajectory. English, um, noticing that, you know, where it did have some more dominance um, decades ago, right, is, is just kind of maintaining and similarly um, projected to not necessarily um, grow that much. And now these are native users of these languages. So the world's um, largest native language is Mandarin, uh, which is off our chart here. Um, so I'll have to adjust the chart a bit to be able to share with you now um, the projected growth of, for example, users of English um, as an additional language. And if you see here, I lost the chart. Um, and just to mark again that we're, we're kind of at that spot, right, where we're seeing actually there are more world speakers now of English than even the world's greatest, um, you know, most spoken native language in the world. Um, what kind of influence does the growth of English have on higher education? Um, with globalization, um, higher education has um, experienced uh, a, a, a quite a big change in um, in its models, um, we're seeing um, an increase in, for example, ideas of higher education marketization. Um, in this study that I conducted uh, with uh, colleagues at the University of Bath, as well as my PhD student at UCL, uh, it was funded by British Academy, we decided to explore this concept um, of the teaching research nexus and looking at the relationship between teaching and research how that plays out as far as different models of higher education go. Um, we highlight these, these four models. Um, so if you look at, for example, traditionalism, you see a close connection between researcher and research students. Um, and so this is where we see a nexus being strongly supported, at least at the postgraduate level. There's progressivism, so a connection enhanced when research activities encompass teaching. So this is where we see nexus enhanced where there is an overlap of research and teaching. So teaching informed research and opposite. Um, social reconstructionism is a, a close connection um, centering on social on a social injustice, social justice agenda. And this is where we see particularly a strong nexus. Um, however, uh, what we do see growing increasingly uh, is the enterprise um, model. Um, so the role of the academic has experienced a seismic shift in recent decades as higher education has become increasingly marketized in our competitive global economy. Um, and our findings from our study suggest that forces separating teaching and research are evident. Uh, the nexus may exist in theory, but in practice, teaching and research are being pulled in different directions. Uh, by different institutional priorities. So institutions that adopt an enterprise ideology, um, this is particularly problematic. So what we see for enterprise is a drift between teaching and research, a transformation of the research teaching nexus into a research innovation nexus. And what you see there is a drop of teaching altogether. Um, concerning Englishization of higher education and research and research output. All right, so some of the important concepts here are English as an academic lingua franca, and also considerations of our growing uh, access to cutting edge knowledge thanks to the internet. Um, so I'm going to refer now to a paper by Montgomery in 2013 uh, that highlights the, the language shares in total academic pub publications. And what you can see here is exponential growth of English and a drop of all other languages. Um, in 2013, uh, Montgomery said that given recent trends, the Chinese could even match the U.S. levels in, in peer-reviewed English language output by about 2025 and perhaps sooner. 
Um, so it is important to note that uh, a lot of the drive of English language publications is actually from China, um, but uh, mostly just because of numbers, right? So numbers of population, such a big population. Uh, certainly uh, the world, right, is increasingly publishing in English. Um, so interesting, he says, yeah, this, this could happen a, about 2025, perhaps sooner. In fact, it happened in 2018. And Tolufsen wrote about this in Nature, uh, in this idea of a shifting landscape where China surged to become the world's largest producer of scientific research articles. Um, now, not necessarily specifics about the languages that are used, um, but for the most part, these publications are in English. Um, and so you can see here, right, so growth um, for China and kind of drops in other areas, although note at the bottom there um, growth from India as well. So basically what we're seeing is, right, with population size, we're seeing this kind of growth. Um, to, and we need to keep an eye on that. As far as Englishization of higher education and teaching goes, internationalization and English medium instruction, or EMI, are intertwined. And Andy Kirkpatrick pointed this out um, a decade ago. And some interesting things here. EMI has become one of the most significant trends facing higher education institutions in non-native English-speaking contexts today. It has been described as a galloping phenomenon uh, considered pandemic in proportion and the most significant trend in educational internationalization. Um, that comes from Julian Chapel from six years ago, an oft-cited article. Um, and then, of course, also described as an unstoppable train by Ernesto Macaro, um, which referred back to that concept over the last six years or so. Um, but this idea of uh, we don't have control over what's happening in this kind of growth is really important. Um, as a uh, a striking statistic comes from Europe. Um, this is from the work of Dr. Mayworm that came out uh, seven years ago now, but the number is astonishing. There has been a 1,115% growth in EMI programs in Europe in just 13 years. What does all this mean as far as the justices go, right? So the injustices and opportunities uh, are, are interesting to note. Um, so the injustices of English as an academic lingua franca as far as research goes, a few things to highlight here. Linguistic injustice is something we talked about in publishing. Um, just to note here, um, in a study that I did with my colleague Heath Rose at the University of Oxford, we looked at the issues of um, journals positioning non-native uh, users of English as somehow deficient in their abilities to use language for publication purposes. This, this was all in, this was found in author guidelines, submission guidelines to journals. Um, one of the, this is just one of many types of publications like this in, in this kind of research. But the interesting thing uh, was that in 2016, Ken Highland, who's a, a prolific uh, researcher in second language writing, um, it made the argument that this idea of linguistic injustice for non-native speakers and non-native users of English um, is a myth. And this kind of argument is an interesting one because the do we want to suggest that somehow there's some something that is um, more or less of a privilege or right depending on someone's nativeness or distance from um, their use of English? So there is an important argument to be made around that. Um, Susina recently, 2020, um, also made a really interesting argument concerning the use of English as an academic lingua franca for publication and in research in general as a sterilization of what we're actually able to say in the research. Um, she talked a bit about this idea of a kind of sameness and how research ultimately ends up favoring white, wealthy men. Um, and it's, it's an interesting concept, I think, if, that if you're working in English, does it also mean that you're working within those types of constructs. Um, in a study that I conducted um, with my PhD student, Agata Mikolaevska, um, and we investigated the situation for scholars in Polish higher education in terms of their access to grants and, and, and research funding. And it was really interesting to note that English was such a big concern. Um, and a lot of it was related to actually having support um, so having um, administrative support in the universities who were functional in the English language to be able to help um, with international funding applications. Uh, as far as teaching goes, back to EMI, a really interesting study by Hu, Li, and Lei uh, in, in 2014, 
Uh, in a case study, their university had several incentives to encourage faculty to teach on EMI programs, including favorable calculations of workload, some material rewards, and increased symbolic recognition. So that is interesting, right, that there were these fa favorable ideas around being able to teach in English. Um, these things, however, were problematic then for those who were unable to teach in English. So as far as opportunities go uh, with English and, and English as an academic lingua franca, in research, um, Lublin points out in a really, really interesting paper in 2018, the idea that our research is much further reaching. So more people can engage in that research if it is published in English. This increases our ease of communication and facilitation of ideas. For teaching, um, the, again, looking at Huli and Lay's ideas in 2014 around EMI incentives, um, they also raise the idea that there's increased access to grants and travel abroad. Um, so where do we go from here? Directions for future research. I just wanted to highlight some of the work, um, again, going back to that, the British Academy study, um, where we need to think about um, where we are. Um, higher education research can be a bit pessimistic. And so what I want to try to suggest is that we try to turn that around and look at the positives. So, for example, um, we, point out, we pointed out in our paper uh, that neoliberalist agendas in universities yield different responses. We disagree that there are only two. One, that there must be eager compliance by opportunistic cynics. Um, this was Smith's idea of flexians. So people who you know, do whatever it takes kind of thing. Um, or a deep sadness or depression that contributes to the prevalence of high stress levels that culminate in burnout and withdrawal from collegial activities. Um, what we found is that although opportunism and angst were both evident in our data, we saw a third response, and that is academics' daily compromises. So there are people, right, academics, who are succeeding um, by working with, working um, kind of a give and take, right? So being able to work on the areas that are, are supporting them, right, and to work with, with those strengths. Um, and to try to play down then any of those things that would otherwise create burnout or heightened stress. Um, so I do hope that moving forward, we can try to find more optimistic approaches to this, um, because obviously there's, it's quite an, a, a large, um, there's quite a large area of research around this, uh, a lot of which is a bit pessimistic uh, in higher education research. So let's try to, yeah, see what we can do with moving forward in a more positive light. Thank you very much.